Welcome to Radical Feminist Perspectives. Today we're going to hear about structural, structural oppression as set out in Marilyn Fry's The Politics of Reality and with reference to D. Graham's Loving to Survive, discussed by Kate Graham and Joe Brew. I'm going to start off with Kate um, and so over to you, Kate. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're from. Um, I'm going to read from a book, uh, which is a collection of essays in feminist theory written some time ago now by Marilyn Fry. It's an absolutely wonderful book. It's called The Politics of Reality. And I'd like to start with just um, mentioning something uh, that she's put in the preface, if you don't mind. And I'm just, I'm just gonna read it. Um, as a writer, I began in the academic environment where one prepares an essay and then goes before an audience and reads it aloud. Outside academia, people sometimes hear speeches and sometimes encounter someone reading a story or a poem aloud uh, to an audience, but the oral delivery of essays is not familiar. These essays are written at least as much for the ear as for the eye. I hope that they will be read aloud both in and out of academic settings. Um, she says something else here that I think is really important. She says, these essays are time bound and culture bound, which should not need saying perhaps, but it does. Feminist thought and theory of college educated white women has been far more accessible in print so far than that of women who have not enjoyed these privileges nor suffered the distinctive set of limitations that come with them. This work is undeniably part of that body of, quote, white and college educated, quote, writing. It stands on those privileges and within those limits, as well as on and within the privilege and limits more particular to my own uh, individual history and situations. To readers who might be able to overlook the ways in which my thought is limited by race and class bound imagination, I have to ask you to take absolutely seriously both the warning and the invitation implicit in my occasional reminders that there exists a vast variety of women and women's lives, which I know just about enough to point to but cannot speak from or for. And then she goes on to encourage women to become engaged and rewrite that. Okay, here we go. Now, a little bit about from the introduction, just a little bit, please. Okay, the introduction. This starts with, this work is a blend of philosophy and art. It is the partial articulation of a worldview, of the shape and structure of the world as this philosopher knows it. It presents images and cameos which by reflections and associations suggest a larger story or picture of how things are. The point of the understanding is not to find and present facts, new or used, but to generate ways of conceiving and interpreting which illuminate the meanings of things already in some ways known. And so to stimulate the invention of more new ways of thinking. Later on in the introduction, she says, Developing theory of this sort is something like reading the varying patterns of the weather off a weatherscape, oh, a weathered landscape, sorry. The observations one makes on the ground are not used as data in any strict sense of the word, so much as they give one clues. One proceeds more by something like an aesthetic sense of pattern or theme than by a classical scientific method. Depending on what one has already figured out, a single detail of an anecdote from one woman's experience 
may be exactly as fertile as a clue, as a carefully gotten and fully documented statistical result from a study of a thousand women. And the velocity of the prevailing winds may be as intelligently, intelligently excuse me, I beg your pardon, may be as intelligible as real life. I think that comment there, that paragraph there reflects really strongly on, on um, uh, um, oh, consciousness raising. You know, some things we can't really, I think, understand or crystallize or see until we've done the consciousness raising that is in fact the process of understanding crystallizing and seeing them. Here we go. This is the first essay then in the book. It's called Oppression. And um, I think it's absolutely brilliant. Now, look, I, I apologize. Many of you may already be absolutely clear about this stuff. I think it's lovely to hear it put so succinctly. I'll try to do it justice. Uh, relax, um, put your headphones on, potter about and do your Sunday morning things if you wish and uh, enjoy. It is a fundamental claim of feminism that women are oppressed. The word oppression is a strong word. It repels and attracts. It is dangerous and dangerously fashionable and endangered. It is much misused and sometimes not innocently. The statement that women are oppressed is frequently met with the claim that men are oppressed too. We hear that oppressing is oppressive to those who oppress as well as to those they oppress. Some men cite as evidence of their oppression their much advertised inability to cry. It is tough, we're told, to be masculine. When the stresses and frustrations of being a man are cited as evidence that oppressors are oppressed, by their oppression, the word oppression is being stretched to meaninglessness. It is treated as though its scope includes any and all human experience of limitation or suffering, no matter the cause, degree or consequence. Once such usage has been put over on us, then if, we, if ever we deny that any person or group is oppressed, we seem to imply that we think they never suffer and have no feelings. We are accused of insensitivity, even of bigotry. How apt is that? For women, such accusation is particularly intimidating. Since sensitivity is one of the few virtues that have been assigned to us. If we are found insensitive, we may fear that we have no redeeming traits at all and perhaps are not real women. Thus, are we silenced before we begin? The name of our situation drained of meaning and our guilt mechanisms are tripped. Amazing, isn't it? But this is nonsense. Human beings can be miserable without being oppressed. And it is perfectly consistent to deny that a person or group is oppressed without denying that they have feelings or that they suffer. We need to think clearly about oppression. And there is much that mitigates against this. I do not want to undertake to prove that women are oppressed or that men are not, but I do want to make clear what is being said when we say it, we need this word, this concept, and we need it to be sharp and sure. Now, before I go into the next, but I do want to mention that the word oppression has been supplanted by privilege, hasn't it, by the Wokarati? And I think that's significant. Anyway, part one. The root of the word oppression is the element press quotes the press of the crowd, pressed into military service, to press a pair of pants, by which she means trousers, the printing press, press 
the button. Presses are used to mold things or flatten them or reduce them in bulk, sometimes to reduce them by squeezing out the gases or liquids in them. Something pressed is something caught between or among forces and barriers, which are so related to each other that jointly they restrain, restrict, or prevent the thing's motion or mobility. Mold, immobilize, reduce. The mundane experience of the oppressed provides another clue. One of the most characteristic and ubiquitous features of the world as experienced by oppressed people is the double bind. The situation in which options are reduced to very few and all of them expose one to penalty, censure or deprivation. For example, it's often a requirement upon oppressed people that we smile and be cheerful. If we comply, we signal our docility and our acquiescence in our situation. We need not then be taken note of. We acquiesce in being made invisible, in occupying no space. We participate in our own erasure. On the other hand, anything but the sunniest countenance exposes us to being perceived as mean, bitter, angry, or dangerous. This means that at the least that we may be found difficult or unpleasant to work with. Oh yes. Which is enough to cast one's, to cost one's livelihood, yeah. At worst, being seen as mean, bitter, angry or dangerous has been known to result in rape, arrest, beating and even murder. One can only choose to risk one's preferred form and rate of annihilation. Another example. It's common in the United States that women, especially younger women, are in a bind when neither sexual activity nor sexual inactivity is all right. If she's heterosexually active, a woman is open to censure and punishment for being loose, unprincipled, or, sorry, I apologize, a whore. The punishment comes in the form of criticism, snide, embarrassing remarks, being treated as an easy lay by men, and scorn from her more restrained female friends. She may have to lie and hide her behavior from her parents. She must juggle the risks of unwanted pregnancy and dangerous contraceptives. On the other hand, if she refrains from heterosexual activity, she's fairly constantly harassed by men who try to persuade her into it and pressure her to relax and let her hair down. She's threatened with labels like frigid, uptight, man-hater, bitch, and cock tease. I'm going to add to that the accusation of lesbian. The same parent who would be disapproving of her sexual activity may be worried by her inactivity because it might suggest she's not nor will be popular or is not sexually normal. Whoa. She may be charged with lesbianism. If a woman is raped, then if she's been heterosexually active, she's subject to the presumption that she liked it, since her activity is presumed to show that she likes sex with men. And if she's not been heterosexually active, she's subject to the presumption that she liked it, since she's supposedly repressed and frustrated. Both heterosexual activity and heterosexual non-activity are likely to be taken as proof that you wanted to be raped, and hence, of course, 
weren't really right at all. You can't win. You're caught in a bind, caught between systematically related pressures. Women are caught like this too by networks of forces and barriers that expose one to penalty, loss or contempt. Whether one works outside the home or not, is on welfare or not, bears children or not, raises children or not, marries or not, stays married or not, is heterosexual, lesbian, both or neither. Uh, sorry, all of that relates to the pressures, obviously the structural pressures, the networks of forces and barriers that we are caught between. Caught between because there's no escape. Economic necessity, confinement to racial and or sexual job ghettos, sexual harassment, sex discrimination, pressures of competing expectations and judgments about women, wives and mothers. She says in the society at large, in radical and ethnic subcultures and in one's own mind. Dependence full or partial on husbands, parents or the state. Commitment to political ideas, loyalties to racial or ethnic or other minority groups. Um, the demands of self-respect, yeah, and the responsibilities to others. Each of these factors exists in complex tension with every other. Um, lost my place. Penalizing or prohibiting all of the apparently available options. And nipping at one's heels always is the endless pack of little things. <laughs> yeah, I love it. If one dresses one way, one is subject to the assumptions that one is advertising one's sexual availability. If one dresses another way, one appears to not care about oneself or to be unfeminine. If one uses strong language, one invites categorization as a whore or a slut. Sorry about that, you know. If one does not, one invites categorization as a lady one too delicately constituted to cope with robust speech or the realities to which it presumably refers. The experience of oppressed people is that living in one's life, oh, sorry, the living of one's life is confined and shaped by forces and barriers which are not accidental or occasional and hence avoidable, but are systematically related to each other um, in such a way as to catch one between and among them and restrict or penalize motion in any direction. It is the experience of being caged in. All avenues in every direction are blocked or booby trapped. Cages. Consider a bird cage. If you look very closely at just one wire in the cage, you cannot see the other wires. If your conception of what is before you is determined by this myopic focus, you could look at that one wire up and down the length of it and be unable to see why a bird would not just fly around the wire anytime it wanted to go somewhere. Furthermore, even if one day at a time you myopically inspected each wire, you would still not see why a bird would have trouble getting past the wires to get anywhere. There is no physical property of any one wire, nothing that the closest scrutiny would discover that will reveal how a bird could be inhibited or harmed by it, except in the most accidental way. It is only when you step back, stop looking at the wires one by one microscopically and take a macroscopic view of the whole cage that you begin to see why the bird does not go anywhere. And then you will see it in a moment. It will require no great subtlety of mental powers 
it is perfectly obvious that the bird is surrounded by a network of systematically related barriers, no one of which would be the least hindrance to its flight, but which by their relations to each other are as confining as the solid walls of a dungeon. I'm gonna interrupt myself there and um, say that with reference to D. Graham's book, Loving to Survive, Sexual Terror, Men's Violence and Women's Lives. That's the subtitle. Um, she describes there why uh, in very clear um, and rational you know, um, argument, why women would not necessarily make that realization of the structural cage of oppression. And she, she says that her thesis very briefly is that women are educated into a class, as a class, as a caste actually, um, into the experience of male violence, the deadly threatening uh, experience of male violence, especially male sexual violence, and that we respond to that through mixtures of psychological and behavioral um, um, reactions and respond, you know, learned responses so that we can survive. And that the full reality of the war on women is too threatening, too overwhelming, too dangerous for us to perceive especially since most of us perceive it in isolation. Um, and that we have to shield our minds from this in a way similar to the way that those hostages from the Stockholm syndrome had to react to their um, danger and the fact that they were hostages and like very likely to be killed. She suggests that we call it the Graham syndrome. Um, yeah, and it's a, a class response to overwhelming threat. So I want to interject here in the middle of what um, Marilyn Fry is saying. Of course, Marilyn wrote this long before Dee Graham came to her understanding. And I think probably before the Stockholm hostage takers had, had uh, you know, before that had happened. So she's saying it's perfectly obvious that the bird is surrounded and implying that it's obvious to us when we look at the whole picture that structural oppression of women exists. Um, and then she goes on to see that it is now possible to grasp one of the reasons why oppression can be hard to see and recognize. Basically, she says again, one can study the elements of an oppressive structure with great care and some goodwill without seeing the structure as a whole. And hence, without seeing or being able to understand that one is looking at a cage and that there are people there who are caged, whose motion and mobility are restricted, whose lives are shaped and reduced. The arresting of vision at a microscopic level yields such common confusion as that about the male opening door ritual. And then she talks about this ritual. I'm going to go really quickly over this. It's quite tedious. This ritual, which is remarkably widespread, uh, puzzles many people. Look at the scene of two people approaching a door. The male approaches slightly ahead. He opens the door. Now, how, one innocently asks, can these crazy women's livers say that that is oppressive? The guy removed a barrier. She says the door opening pretends to be a helpful service, but the helpfulness is false. It can be seen by noting that it will not, it will be done whether or not it makes any practical sense. Infirm men and men burdened with, pa with packages will open doors for able-bodied women, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, okay, the fact, the act, sorry, is not determined by sorry, the um, act is not determined by convention or grace. Numerous acts of unneeded or even noisome help occur in counterpoint to a pattern of men not being helpful in many practical ways in which women would welcome help. What women experience is a world in which gallant princes charmingly commonly make a fuss about being helpful uh, and provide small services when help and services are of little or no use, but in which there are rarely ingenious and adroit princes at hand when substantial assistance is really actually wanted. 
either in mundane affairs or in situations of threat, assault or terror. There's no help with the laundry, she says his laundry, no help typing a report at 4am, no help in mediating disputes among relatives or children. There's nothing but advice that women should stay indoors after dark, be chaperoned by a man, or if it comes down to it, lie back and enjoy it. These gallant gestures have no practical meaning. Blah, blah, blah. Finally, these gestures imitate the behaviour of servants toward masters and thus mock women, who are in most respects the servants and caretakers of men. The message of false helpfulness of male gallantry is female dependence. The invisibility and insignificance of women and contempt for women. One cannot see the meanings of these rituals if one's focus is riveted upon the individual, uh, individual event in all its particularity, including the particularity of the individual's man's present conscious intentions and motives, and the individual woman's conscious perception of the event in the moment. So sorry to interrupt, but um, I think what she's saying here is that in order for the personal to be political, not only do we have to see it in a broader context, but we have to realize the role and um, perhaps realize the perspective, you know, get a greater perspective of our perception of what's going on. Uh, perhaps develop a sort of humility to realize we may be duped. We may have a false loyalty to a particular man. Anyway, back to her. She says, it seems sometimes that people take a deliberately myopic view and fill their eyes with things that seem microscopically in order not to see macroscopically. At any rate, whether it's deliberate or not, people can and do fail to see the oppression of women because they fail to see macroscopically and hence fail to see the various elements of the situation as systematically related in larger schemes. As the cagedness of the birdcage is a macroscopic phenomenon, the oppressiveness of the situations in which women live our lives is a macroscopic phenomenon. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next bit, part two. The image of the cage. Concern about time. The image of the cage helps convey one aspect of the systematic nature of oppression. Another is, here we go, the selection of occupants of the cages. And the analysis of this aspect also helps account for the invisibility of the oppression of women. It is as a woman or as a Chicano or as a black or Asian or lesbian that one is entrapped. Why can't I go to the park? You let Jimmy go because it's not safe for girls. I want to be a secretary, not a seamstress. I don't want to learn to make dresses. There's no work for, she uses the word Negroes, which was um, used at the time of her writing the book. There's no work for Negroes in that line. Learn a skill where you can earn a living. And that's a quote from another book, but I'm gonna lose my place if I look for that. When you question why you're being blocked, why there's barriers in your path, the answer has not to do with individual talent or merit, handicap, disability, or failure of any sort. It has to do with your membership in some category understood as natural, physical, the inhabitant of the cage is not an individual, but a group, all those of a certain category. If an individual is oppressed, it is in virtue, in the virtue of being a member of the group or category of people that is systematically reduced, molded and immobilized. Thus, to recognize a person as oppressed 
one has to see that individual as belonging to a group of a certain sort. There are many things that can encourage or inhibit perception of one's membership in the sort of group or category in question here. Yeah. In particular, it seems reasonable to suppose that if one of the devices of restriction and definition of the group is that of physical confinement, or segregation, the confinement and separation would encourage recognition of the group as a group. Let's try that again. In particular, it seems reasonable to suppose that if one of the devices of restriction of the group is that of segregation, that segregation would encourage recognition of the group as a group. Right? This in turn would encourage the macroscopic focus, which enables one to recognize oppression and encourages the individual's, individual's identification, solidarity with other individuals in that group. But physical confinement and segregation of the group as a group is not common to all oppressive structures. And when an oppressed group is geographically and demographically dispersed, across the world, the perception of it as a group is inhibited. There may be little or nothing in the situations of the individuals encouraging the macroscopic focus, which would reveal the unity of the structure, bearing down on all members of that group. And then she has a footnote talking about coerced assimilation with reference to uh, Native Americans. A great many people, female and male and of every race and class, simply do not believe that woman is a category of oppressed people. And I think this is in part because they've been fooled by the dispersal and the assimilation of women throughout and into the systems of class and race which organize men. Our simply being dispersed makes it difficult for women to have knowledge of each other and hence difficult to recognize the shape of our common cage. The dispersal and assimilation of women throughout economic classes and race divides us against each other practically and economically and thus attaches interest to the inability to see. For some, jealousy of their benefits, and for some, resentment of the other's advantages. To get past this, it helps to notice that in fact, women of all races and classes are together in a ghetto of sorts. There is a woman's place, a sector, which is inhabited by women of all classes and races. And it's not defined by geographical boundaries, but by function. The function is the service of men and men's interests as men define them, which includes the bearing and rearing of children. The details of this service and the working conditions vary by race and class for men of different races and classes of different interests, perceive their interests differently and express their needs and demands in different rhetorics, dialects and languages. But there are also some constants. Excuse me. <coughs> Whether in lower, middle or upper class home or work situations, women's service work always includes personal service. This is the work of maids, butlers, cooks, and personal secretaries. Sexual service, including provision for his genital sexual needs and bearing his children, but also including being nice, being attractive for him, and so on and so forth. Ego service, encouragement, support, praise, attention. Women's service work also is characterized everywhere 
by the fatal combination of responsibility and powerlessness. Yeah. We are held responsible and we hold ourselves responsible for good outcomes for men and children in almost every respect. And yet we have almost no power adequate to that project. The details of the subjective experience of this servitude are local. They vary with economic class and race and ethnic tradition, as well as the personalities of the men in question. So also are the details of the forces which coerce our tolerance of this servitude. They are particular to the different situations in which different women live and work. All this is not to say that women do not have, assert and manage sometimes to satisfy our own interests, nor to deny that in some cases, in some respects, women's independent interests do overlap with men's. But at every race and class level, and even across race and class lines, men do not serve women as women serve men. Okay, I'm looking at time and I'm thinking I may need to skip through some parts. I promise I will do it justice. Part three, it seems to be the human condition that in one degree or another, we all suffer frustration and limitation. All right. There are unwelcome barriers that we all experience. Um, we are social species. Our behavior and activities are structured by more than individual inclination. Structure consists of boundaries, limits, and barriers. In a structured whole, some motions and changes are possible and others are not. If one is looking for an excuse to dilute the word oppression, one can look at the fact of social structure as an excuse and say that everyone is oppressed. But if one would get rather clear about what oppression is and is not, one needs to sort out the sufferings, harms and limitations and figure out which are the elements of oppression and which are not. I'm getting distracted by the chat um, screens that are coming up. I, can only, I can't multitask, so I'm envious of you people who can. But uh, I'm going to try and ignore some women appear to be talking about men. <clears throat> From what I've already said here, it's clear that if one wants to determine whether a particular suffering, harm or limitation is caused, is in part of someone's being oppressed, one has to look at it in context. Okay. If a rich white play playboy who lives off income from his investments in South African diamond mines should break a leg in a skiing accident um, and wait in pain in a blizzard before he's rescued, we may assume that he suffers. His suffering comes to an end. He's soon recuperating. Sipi Shivas Regal. Nothing in this picture suggests a structure of barrier or forces. Even if the accident was caused by malicious uh, negligence, um, the person is not seen as an agent of oppression. Okay, moving on. Similarly for restraints and constraints due to traffic regulations. Um, another example. Um, they, are, they are part of a structure that shapes our behavior not to our reduction and immobilization, but rather to the protection of our continued ability to move and act at will. Then she says, the boundaries of a racial ghetto in an American city serve to some extent to keep white people from going in, as well as to keep ghetto dwellers out. Sorry, what? From going out. A particular white citizen may be frustrated or feel deprived. This is not make the white person, this is, does not mean they're in a situation of being oppressed. One must look at the barrier. One must look at the consequences. 
barriers have different meanings to those on opposite sides of them, even though they are barriers to both. The physical walls of a prison no more dissolve to let an outsider in than to let an insider out. But for the insider, they're confining and limiting, while to the outsider, they may mean protection from what she or he take to be threats. The service sector of wives, mamas, assistants and girls is almost exclusively a women-only sector. Its boundaries not only enclose women, but to a great extent keep men out. Sometimes men experience this as a restriction on their movements. They may claim or like to imagine that they are too oppressed by sex roles, but that barrier is erected and maintained by men for the benefit of men. Okay, then she talks a little bit more about that. If a person's life or activity is affected by some force or barrier, one may not conclude that person is oppressed simply because the person encounters that barrier of force, but nor simply because the barrier is unpleasant, frustrating or painful to that person at that time, nor uh, because the existence or the process that maintain or apply it serve to deprive that, deprive that person of something of value one must look at the barrier and ask certain questions about it. Here we go. Who constructs and maintains it? Whose interests are served by its existence? Is it part of a structure that tends to confine, reduce or immobilize some group? Is the individual a member of the confined group? Various forces, barriers and limitations may be part of an oppressive structure or not. And if they are, the person may be either on the side of the oppressed or the oppressor side of it. Oh yes. One cannot tell which by how loudly or how little the person complains. Isn't that brilliant? <laughs> okay, here we go. Many, part four, many of the restrictions and limitations we live with are more or less internalized, this is important, and self-monitored and are part of our adaptions to the requirements, adaptations, I beg your pardon, to the requirements and expectations imposed by the needs and tastes and tyrannies of others. So she's talking about self-imposed restrictions, she sees it as self-imposed restrictions and limitations. Um, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. I'm going to again reference uh, D. Graham. Our collusion with male supremacy in terms of our adoption of behaviours, including uh, costumes, makeups, um, but also acquiescence to female speech being interrupted, giving way to men. Um, that's a fact. These are real. Uh, these are realities. Um, they make us to a greater or lesser extent collaborators. It's a major problem for us in how to move on. We've seen it with the trans issue. Some women have stood up to it in varying degrees and suffered massive consequences as a result. It's incredibly brave. We all have. I mean, I have. Not to the same extent as some others who've lost their professional career. Um, and others who have had the ongoing death and rest, uh, rape, death and rape threats. But I think that, as D. Graham says, a lot of these uh, decisions or realities but acquiescing to this are not within our conscious control. I don't think that we're conscious of them, hence the term consciousness raising. We need to become conscious of them and that means becoming conscious of the reality of the femicide and the war on women and the reality of all men's participation in preserving and maintaining that femicide benefiting from it obviously 
That's a big ask. Okay. So they are more or less internalized. That's a big thing. And self-monitored. All right. I have in mind such things as women's cramped postures and attenuated strides and men's restraint of emotional self-expression, except for anger. Who gets what out of the practice of these disciplines and who imposes what penalties for improper relaxations of them? What are the rewards of this self-discipline? And then she talks about men crying in the company of men. Um, consider by comparison the discipline of women's cramped physical posture and attenuated stride. This discipline can be relaxed in the company of women. It's generally at most strenuous in the company of men. And she refers to a book called Let's Take Back Our Space, Female and Male Body Language as a Result of Patriarchal Structures by Marianne Wex um, in West Germany, Hermi Hermine Fees, uh, Frau Literature Verlag, Hermine Fees in West Germany, 1979. Thank you very much, Marianne. Blah, blah, blah. But unlike, Oh, like men's emotional restraint, women's physical restraint is required by men. But unlike the case of men's emotional restraint, women's physical restraint is not rewarded. What do we get for it? Respect and esteem and acceptance. You're going to laugh. We look silly, incompetent, weak, and generally uh, contemptible. Our exercise of this discipline tends to low esteem and low self-esteem. It does not benefit us. It fits in a network of behaviour through which we constantly announce to others our membership in a lower caste and our unwillingness or inability to defend our bodily or moral integrity. It is degrading and part of a pattern of degradation. The social effect is that women's restraint is part of a structure oppressive to women Man's restraint is part of a structure oppressive to women. Ten minutes left. I have just enough time to say that Simone de Beauvoir, you know, I haven't read her book, right? You know, but she is quoted, um, and apparently the quote is taken out of context, but there's this notion that womanhood is learned and that are this this is what they mean they mean our they mean what d graham's talking about there they mean that our acquiescence to a set of caste determines uh caste determined structural oppressive behaviors and um mannerisms uh, are part of what define us as women now i disagree with that but this is what's used by many women to identify us as a class of women. And these women are now deeply confused because we have, as we know, a subset of men who are adopting these behaviours, I would argue, in order to mock and ridicule women. Oh, look, there's a woman outside reading. Can you see? I don't know if you can see beyond that lace curtain. She's reading my slate up there that says that Scotland needs um and that tea that boy's got a t-shirt on that says Pornhub. Fucking hell. Sorry about that. If uh, if I were not doing this I would go outside and get involved in a big argument with her. But anyway, where was I? My point is that um they are identifying men who behave in this way as a subclass, well as a class of women, trans women. And that's clearly absolutely fucking bollocks. Why have I sworn? So the social effect is drastically different. This is crucial. The man's restraint and behaviour, therefore, is part of a structure oppressive to women. There you go. You have it. Part five, nearly done. I'll be quick. One is marked. One is marked for the application of oppressive pressures by one's membership in some group or category. Much of one's suffering and frustration befalls one partly or largely because one is a member of that category. Right. In the case at hand is the category woman. Being a woman is a major factor in my not having a better job than I do. 
being a woman selects me as a likely victim of sexual assault or harassment. It is my being a woman that reduces the power of my anger to a proof of my insanity. That is so heavy. If a woman has little or no economic or political power or achieves little of what she wants to achieve, a major causal factor in this is that she is a woman. For any woman of any race or economic class, being a woman is significantly attached to whatever disadvantages and deprivation she suffers, be they great or small. None of this is the case with respect to a person being a man. Simply being a man or not is not what stands between him and a better job. Whatever assaults and harassments he's subject to, being male is not what selects him for victimization. Being male is not a factor that would make his anger impotent, quite the opposite. If a man has little or no material or political power or achieves little of what he wants to achieve, his being male is no part of the explanation. Being male is something he has going for him, even if race or class or age or disability is going against him. Women are oppressed as women. Members of certain racial and economic groups and classes, both the males and the females are oppressed as members of those races and classes, but men are not oppressed as men. And she finishes up by saying, isn't it strange that any of us should have ever been confused and mystified about such a simple thing? Thank you for listening to that, everyone. Thank you very much for your some of your kind comments regarding my reading style. I'm a teacher, so um, I hope I've given you enough take up time, as we call it in the trade. Um, and I hope that my references to uh, D. Graham and certain quite famous feminists, um, well, I've managed not to name them, haven't I? who are confused about trans, so-called trans uh, people, um, who are simply cross-dressing men, as we know. Um, I hope they're appropriate. Sorry about the interruption with the people outside. There were three kids and a woman that one of the boys had a Pornhub t-shirt on. He was about maybe nine, 10 years old. Um, we all do what we can, don't we? Yo, can I invite you back in? Yeah, yeah. So that was fantastic. And I was able to read the comments as well. Um, there were lots of uh, really fantastic, appreciative comments. Um, and uh, I agree with the people. Uh, quite a few of the women said you've got such a clear voice and just lovely. It was lovely to hear you reading it. And then also your analysis was was fantastic. So it's yeah, great. So when when did you first read this book? Oh, God, I really don't know. You know, my memory is really bad. I'm autistic and um, I have very, very limited memory. Um, um, yeah, so I really can't remember. Most of my understanding and analysis was 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 adopted during the, you know, or came to during the second the second wave, as we call it, you know, back in the 70s. I would have been at a workshop and when this came out and I would have heard women talking about it. I worked at a women's centre in, in um, London for a while. Um, when did it come out? It's 1983. I just looked at it. Um... Um, well, in that case, it would have been just at the end of that time. Yeah. yeah crossing press, we used to get the deliveries. Um, it was so exciting, you know. Um, we had a bookshop and, and meeting rooms and stuff. And uh, yeah, it would have been when I was working there. Yeah. Would you say it's one of the most important books that you've read, like one of yes. the best books? Absolutely. Yes. I love her. I mean, I know it's a, some, there are some big words in it and there are some sort of long sentences, which, you know, she says, as the critic and the initiator of the topic, this is not how we speak. Right. Um, but it's very accessible. It's extremely accessible. And, 
you know, I have been to university, but I did engineering. So, you know, I don't have a history of sociologic, sociological speak. I haven't done psychology or, you know, political science even. Um, and so, yeah, but more than- I mean, the thing I, I was thinking when listening to you um, is I've uh, seen that philosophy, when philosophy is taught in schools, they talk about Aristotle and John Stuart Milne and Plato and people, mm -hmm. and they talk about this, the the cave, of this, this idea of someone being in a cave and not being able to get out and stuff. It's all men, and they're all talking about these sort of moral stories, whereas the two big things that you sort of mentioned that I thought could be taught always in philosophy to to girls particularly is Marilyn Fry's birdcage analogy that's that should be fundamental to philosophy it's such a useful part of uh, uh, understanding our oppression and then the uh yeah the the Graham syndrome could be could be really good because it's it's it gives you this fantastic insight into um our mm. oppression but of course, they they don't want to teach that in schools because then girls might might be have their consciousness raised, as you pointed out. Mm. Well, I think consciousness raising has to uh, come about as a proactive thing for it for each individual woman. Actually, I don't think it can be kind of taught. I think that um, our experience shows us that um, you know it's a group of women. I think you need to meet once a week. At the, once a fortnight at the minimum I think you should meet in each other's homes or houses not in pubs or it has to be I'm sorry it's, you know it has to be a safe space um when I did it it was a lesbian consciousness raising group a lot of beer was drunk I was very young I was drinking milk actually at the time um ironically and um, and we talked about our experience we talked about our experience as young women when did we first re meet up with some of these uh, restrictions what was the context and then gradually we got on to talking about more and more important things I think a, a discussion within a consciousness raising group about our relationship with our mothers is really really important and a very very deep and meaningful one and um do you think it's possible now to have like, it would be because one of the things I worry about now is that there's so much um, mm -hmm. sort of colonization of women's minds by the media like if they're mostly watching the mainstream media and things like mm -hmm. RuPaul's Drag Race mm -hmm. then if unless they had some input of feminism yeah. like like we had in the 80s it was much more around and in the ether um uh, would you, uh, do you think women could just do it now just by meeting up yeah I think yeah. there was uh, yeah I think that look I I, I didn't read I, I, I read maths books and I read poetry and stuff like that right but um most most women do and do you remember Kate Millett came along um, and um and she talked about three very famous, very widely read texts, right? There was the, oh God, by these three, Henry Mailer, oh, yes. yeah, yeah. Mailer, Norman Mailer, and Lawrence, was it Lawrence? What's his name? So now what struck me and what struck me when I first read a few books as well is how isolated you are when you experience the shock of the woman hating in the text, the sexual violation in the text. So it was, oh God, what's that woman's name? The French, the... Irish woman, I had it on the tip of my tongue there. Country girls, she wrote. Do you know who it is? Oh, I, t I haven't read that. Yeah. Oh, God, don't. I mean, you know, and I mean, I was really young. I was like twelve or thirteen, and I, my, I was trying to, I was trying to befriend a woman who I probably had a bit of a crush on actually, and she was the minister's daughter, my local church minister's daughter, and she had an older brother, and he lent me this book, right? The country girls, Mary O'Brien. Oh, it's coming to me. Yeah, Edna O'Brien, they're saying. Edna O'Brien, yeah. yes. Yeah. There's a description in there of her sexual abuse, right? A description of this guy's penis and balls. I can remember that. How purple. Oh, God. Yeah. Anyway, um, um, I am encountered that as a in isolation because I was yeah. reading and with no reference. So that there was only, unless you're doing literary criticism, there's no... Uh, examining deep examining of the text right so you're vulnerable to it absolutely yeah. in the same way that we're vulnerable in a similar way to the way that we're vulnerable to the visual crap that we get and we also had all the 50s and 60s and the advertising and all this we tackled sex role stereotyping up uh, we 
my big sisters tackled sex role stereotyping um, despite being completely immersed in it um, yeah. in the in a media onslaught. So yeah. Brilliant. Well, I'm going to I'm going to break in now and say um, we're we're running late. We're one minute past 11 in UK time. So we're going to have to stop. We've we've done the, a faux pas. Um, thank you so much, Kate. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, mm. I, I, I'm sure everybody enjoyed it as much as I did. There's just everybody's using the little emojis we've got <laughs> now saying how much they loved it. Um, and thank you for putting up with the um, potential disruption um, outside your window. So and keeping going. And um, uh, yeah, and next week we have um, a we have the I'm just going to get it up. Um, the Hijab and the Republic, Uncovering French Headscarf Debate by Bronwyn Winter, which is a book discussed by Bronwyn Winter and Sheila Jeffries. Excellent. So that will be absolutely brilliant. And um, thanks very much. Then there's a breakout room you can go to if you want to and see you next week. And thanks, Kate. Thanks very much. Cheers. Have a good day. Bye, everybody.